Okay, we see people are coming, so we can yeah, wait. Yeah. Seconds more, but I think we are ready, ready to go. So okay, welcome everyone. It's one minute past eleven in Boston at least AM. So yeah, as you as you notice, today we a little bit go back to our sub series of talks about the uh, structures uh, in terms of cryo EM ex experimental techniques. Now cryo EM is more and more popular and it's like super super important structures for our community. And as you see with Rachel, we try to. Uh, make this platform for people doing molecular dynamics, pure CASP winning stuff, but also how to interpret and how to learn about the dynamics of this huge complexes like splicing, like ribozyme, and in this case, group two introns and slash splicing today. So I'm really excited about it. And today we have uh, Nafte Tor, and he's a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And the main uh, goal of his lab is to inv investigate relationship between RNA structure and biology using tools ranging from cryo EM to single molecule fluorescence. We just talked about it, his PhD. So PhD is biochemistry, but apparently what he just said, he did uh, some work in bioinformatics. So maybe we'll have time to, to talk about it. But for his postdoc, he moved into X-ray crystallography at that time uh, with uh, Anna Pyle at the Yale University where he solved for the first time group two introns and the structure was very very important also for the splicing community because it gave a lot of interesting inspiring ideas what could be tested for the spliceosomes and most of the uh, most of the insights were actually correct and it was giving yet uh, another evidence evidence that group two introns and splicing may share a common ancestor uh, more recently, he used cryo EM and shape experiments to learn about uh, dynamics uh, of group two introns and also look at the cataly catalysis and different uh, in different uh, change uh, changes in the catalytic core. And just my personal take uh, after doing bioinformatics over ten years, uh, I, I myself. Uh, performed some wet experiments with Magda Konarska, uh, inspired directly by uh, NAV work, NAV's, NAV's work. So I'm like really, really excited uh, for his talk. And yeah, with that, the screen is yours. And I see Magda just wrote to me. <laughs> I don't know if they can listen. So yeah, NAV, uh, NAV it's, it's great that you brought this, you know, community once again, uh, this time online. So the screen is yours. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Magnus, for that great introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about our lab's experience in studying group two introns and RNA structure in, in general. So we'll start off just a brief intro of what are group two introns. So group two introns are non-coding RNA sequences that are autocatalytic. Uh, they're self-splicing. They don't need any protein to catalyze the, the splicing reaction. So on the left here, you have our pre-mRNA consisting of a five prime exon, the group two intron, and the three prime exon. So the first step of splicing, you have this two prime hydroxyl from the ribose sugar of a conservative adenosine residue attack the five prime splice site. That results in formation of this two prime five prime linkage, also known as the lariat, the circular RNA. In the second step, this three prime hydroxyl attacks the splice site and you get ligation of the exons and release of the intron in lariate form. So in most eukaryotes, including humans, we have also have share, we, we share a mechanistic um, details with the group two introns in terms of our introns that are in our genomes. Um, but in this case, the catalytic functionality is built into this large multi-megadalton complex known as the spliceosome. So the spliceosome will grab a hold of this intron in trans and catalyze the exact same stereochemistry as the group two intron. Um, because of this shared biochemistry between these two types of introns, it was a long hypothesized that maybe the group two introns were ancestral to the spliceosome. So I first, as, as Megan has mentioned, I, I first started studying group two introns in grad school. So I've been studying group two introns for 26 years, um, long time. 
Uh, so when I first started off in my PhD, I wasn't doing any any experiments. I was purely doing bioinformatics. So I spent the first two thirds of my PhD just looking at group two interon RNA sequences, folding them into distinct classes of secondary structure, which were um, correlated with the evolution of the of the corresponding RT protein that these group two introns have, which I'll get into later. And so after staring at these 2D structures for many years, um, for my postdoc, I wanted to find out how these things would fold into three dimensions. Because I, I, every time I'd look at these sequences, like for example, on the left here, I would see conserved sequences, patches of conserved sequences. And I just, in my head, I'd be like, how, do they, how does it come together to form a three-dimensional structure? And why is it conserved? Um, and yeah, so my, for my postdoc, I worked on the crystal structure of the group two. And when I was in grad school, looking at these sequences, looking at the secondary structures of RNAs, I was also obsessed with um, this one domain in the group two intron known as domain five. So this domain is the most highly conserved domain in the group two intron. It's also uh, very similar to the U2, U6 pairing in the spicesome. So in both cases, you have this conserved catalytic triad of residues at the base. Then you go up five base pairs. Then there's a two nucleotide bulge. So this arrangement seems to be conserved from um, humans to bacteria. How could something this small actually form an active site? So I wanted to get insight into that. Um, and so this is the secondary structure of the group two intron that I'll be talking about today. So there's uh, it has six distinct domains. So there's this large domain one here, which has exon binding sequences that compare to the five and three prime splice sites to um, orient them properly for catalysis. This, uh, this domain here, known as domain four, in some group two introns, it has an open reading frame for reverse transcriptase protein, also known as the maturase. And I'll get into what it does later on. And this is the domain I was interested in most. This is domain five. And the domain five, just based on its conservation before there was any structure, was taught to form the active site for splicing. And this domain known as domain six, also known as the branch site helix, this is the domain that has that highly conserved adenosine residue that attacks the five prime splice site to form that characteristic circular lariat intermediate. And so a while ago, we were our lab was able to solve um, the first crystal structure of an intron lariat. And so this was the eukaryotic group two intron, which is different, different has different um, chemists, different activity than the bacterial ones, more similar to the spliceosome. And this was of the group two intron in the post-catalytic state. So after both steps of splicing have happened. And in this, in this structure, we could see the active site required for eukaryotic uh, RNA splicing. Um, and this is work done by Russell Chan, uh, Jesse Peters, and Aaron Robart. Um, and so looking at the active site, we could see that the bulge in the catalytic triad, it coordinated two catalytic metals that are spaced four angstroms apart, which is characteristic of a two metal ion mechanism of catalysis where one metal um, stabilizes the transition state and the other one activates the nucleophile for attack. In addition, we saw these two accessory metals, M3, M4, which help position the five prime splice site. So that the right position is cut by these two catalytic uh, metals. And I should add that this green part of this RNA is highly conserved all the way from group two introns and to yeast and mammalian introns as well. Um, and so but a year after we put out that crystal structure, the first um, high resolution Crow-EM structures of, of the spliceosome started coming out from Kaoshi and Guy's lab, Yi Gong Shi and Reinhard Lerman. And this is a a figure from one of the papers, and they compared the core of our uh, eukaryotic group to intron with the core of the spliceosome. So in both cases, you have this bulge and catalytic triad coordinating these two catalytic metals that are spaced about four angstroms apart. And I didn't talk about this, but in the group two intron, we saw a triple helix in the active site, and that was also seen in the spliceosome as well. And so we were we were quite excited to to see this work um, because this was the first 
hard structural evidence for an evolutionary connection between the group two intron and the spliceosome. So it's likely that the group two intron was ancestral to the spliceosome. Um, and then subsequently after putting out that lariat intron structure, we also were able to solve the structure of the intron prior to the second step. So this is where the five prime splice site is cleaved. Um, and then the five prime, the three prime hydroxyl of the five prime exon is directly positioned over the, the three prime splice site. And so this was the first structure of either the group two intron or, or the spliceosome at that at that um, intermediate state. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this. Um, yeah, so here you see in the in the layer three prime exon, you can see that the um, the, the nucleophile is positioned right over the three prime splice site in close, close proximity to these two catalytic metals. Unlike in the post-catalytic state where the exons have been ligated and the three prime end has been moved out of the active site. Okay, so now I'm so I mentioned that there's so, so that was our insight into just plain splicing with no RT protein involvement. So group two introns, many of them encode reverse transcriptases. So that's weird because their introns are not supposed to encode anything, but some of them actually do. They'll have in that domain four an open reading print for the reverse transcriptase known as a matrace. And what that matrace can do is it can help function as an accessory protein, kind of like a chaperone to help the RNA fold better um, under low anionic conditions. So the matrix protein can bind to the intron RNA and favor the forward splicing reaction. So uh, you end up with, at the very end, you have this valerate RNA in a very tight complex with that matrix protein and also ligated exons as well. So once you have this RNA protein complex here, it can do something unusual. It can actually, so this intron can not only splice itself out of RNA, it can also insert into DNA. So it can recognize a double-stranded DNA target site using Watson-Crick pairing. And what happens initially is that this intron RNA will reverse splice into the top strand of the DNA and connect itself on both ends. So it covalently connected connect itself both in the five prime and the three prime end. And the protein assists in this process because the protein kind of helps uh, kind of melt, partially melt the target DNA. That lets the intron RNA reverse splice into it. Um, and then the protein kicks in even more. It then cleaves the bottom strand of the DNA using an endonuclease activity. And then the RT domain kicks in and starts making cDNA using that intron RNA as a template. Then eventually the top strand is filled in by host repair enzymes. And you have the group two intron moving into a new location in the genome. So we had structures of the group two intron in, by the, in terms of just the, uh, RNA alone. We wanted to get insight into this mechanism called retrotransposition because this is how a big chunk of the human genome is a, it, it, it's comprised of retro elements, retro elements that insert themselves into DNA in a very similar mechanism to the group two intron. And those retro elements, also called line elements, are also thought to be evolutionarily related, descended from the group two intron as well. So this is a work done by Daniel Hack, a postdoc in the lab. So what Dan did is he made, um, a short double-stranded DNA target where he biotin labeled one of the strands and then he incubated it with his RMP and it began the process of reverse splicing into the top strand of the DNA. So it took him quite a quite a long time to just get large quantities of this soluble RMP complex that would be that would exhibit high levels of activity. And then he used that biotin and he pulled down only integrated complex. So we're not so that, that avoids just pulling down um, RMP that's not integrated. So that, that's the advantage of using this biotin pull down. Um, so we collected data on a Titan Krios. And uh, after analyzing 
the 3D, the, the, the classes, there were two classes that went to relatively high resolution. And looking at the resolution distribution, you can see the majority of the core of the intron is about three angstroms. The overall resolution is 3.6 because we have these ex extraneous solvent exposed domains that are floppy, but they're not important for the catalysis. But the the core of the majority of the structure is 3.0 in angstroms in resolution. And so when Dan was looking at these uh, the two high resolution classes, he noticed there was, there was a big significant difference between between them. Um, so just before I get into that, so you can see the the yellow, which is the RT protein, the matrace. You can see the DNA, one of the DNA strands snaking through the active site. But you notice this red helix, um, it was in two different orientations. So in one of them was pointing down. And then this other orientation is pointing straight up out of the screen. And, and then he started modeling into this, into this density. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you the density because um because a lot of times resolution estimates in CrowdEM are not that accurate. Uh sometimes they'll you know say it's high resolution, but it's really not. So I just want to show this is what the core looked like. It was clearly 3.0 angstrom's resolution, clear base separation. And it's relatively um uh, we could model Dan could model into this density with high confidence. And so when he looked at it, he uh, he actually found that that was the bright side helix. So the bright side helix has that conser highly conserved adenosine residue. It's also conserved in the spicesome as well. And it's existing in two different states. Um, so then I'm just going to show you a movie transitioning between these two different conformations. And so, so this work actually answered a longstanding question in group two intron um, biology, which was that there's two active sites for, uh, well, no, sorry, there, there's not two active sites. I mean, there's two different sets of substrates and products, but there's only one active site. So how are these different substrates and products brought into the single active site? How are they, how are they, how are they shuffled in and out? And so when this, when this uh, domain six moves up and down, you'll notice that so the active site is right here. You'll see that there's things that are moving around in that active site. And so this is the mechanism through how the, fir the first step substrates are brought in, the products are brought out, and then the second step substrates are brought in and the products are brought up. So it's this mechanical way of doing it. Um, and so this gives you, uh, this is looking at the core of the intron. So initially before reverse splicing happened. So the, he got two structures. He got one where it were started the process of reverse splicing and the, and the other structure was of the intron when it just grabs a hold of the substrate and hasn't yet reacted. And that's what this represents. So in this case, this is the target strand and the, and the, the junction between the yellow and the blue is what the intron is going to attack to form, um, to form a reverse splice product. So this three prime hydroxyl attacks this junction right here and becomes connected to this yellow DNA. So when this large scale conformational change happens, this, that is now brought out of the active site and it's way up here at the upper, at this top part here. And that starts the second step of reverse splicing. Um, and so you can see that that's how the substrate gets moved out, just with that movement of, of domain six, the branch site helix. And so we have these two different states of the branch site. One is the one, the vertical position is actually held in place by two tetra loop receptor interactions. And these receptor interactions are known as eta and pi. So it's this little, it's a tandem tetra loop type interaction. Um, and then when it when it uh when it starts to process reverse splicing, it actually will move up and form this horizontal position. So there's so basically a 90 degree change between the two stages of, of catalysis. And so we wanted to look at the interactions that hold it in that horizontal position. So in this horizontal position, there's two contacts. There is an RNA-RNA contact, and that's known as iota. 
Um, and that was first discovered by Francois Michel, um, just using bio, bio, biochemistry. And, and then there's this top interaction. This is an RNA protein contact. So there's multiple side chains that intercalate into the RNA helix. So we wanted to see um, the significance of this RNA protein contact in catalyzing splicing. So up until now, I've been talking about reverse splicing, but reverse splicing and forward splicing are equivalent to each other. And one is just a reverse of the other. And so here we're looking at a forward splicing assay and looking at the effect of making mutations on this interface. So when you mutate these residues to disrupt this interaction, we can, uh, we can actually see what the effect will be on the splicing reaction. So looking at this gel here, this band here is unspliced precursor. So it's five prime axon attached to the intron and then there's three prime axon. So it's not spliced at all. So this wild type, um, and when it splices, it actually migrates slower on a gel and that's the intron, fully spliced intron area. When you mutate this interface, you get no lyric being formed. So that means that this interface, this, um, this interaction between the protein and the RNA is required for the very first step of splicing for positioning that branch site conserved adenosine over the five prime splice site. And so this was the first time that we actually had a functional role for the mat uh, matrix. So typically in the literature, um, it was long thought that maybe the matrix is just playing a general role as a chaperone. It just helps it fold into the right structure. But right here, we can see it's actually guiding the movement of one of the RNA helices by positioning and positioning it for the first step of, of splicing. Um, and so one thing I haven't got into yet is how is the adenosine positioned in the active site? So for the first step of splicing, if you have when you have this bulge adenosine residue, this is the two prime hydroxyl, it has to be positioned precisely over the five prime splice site in close proximity to the two catalytic metals for nucleophilic attack. And so this adenosine is highly conserved in group two introns, as I mentioned but it's also highly conserved in the splice zone. So the splice zone has an equivalent branch site helix that I'll get into, and it's also conserved there as well. So we, uh, well, uh, since I was in grad school looking at those you know, secondary structures, I was wondering why is it always, almost always an adenosine residue? Why can't it be you know, one of the other three residues? Um, uh, so the hypothesis I, I had for since grad school was that there's probably like a specific binding pocket um, for this adenosine uh, nuclear base. So what was known about, about the adenosine positioning for splicing from, from current, current structures? So there was some insight from the spliceosome. So this is the first paper is from Kaushi in the guy's lab with Wojtek, um, the first author. And they presented a structure of the splices and where it had already undergone branching. So the first step had happened, but the adenosine residue hadn't left the active site yet. And so the larry bond was still near the active site. And what they saw was that the adenosine was, uh, was participating in a base triple within the branch site helix. So the adenosine had to kind of turn inward. It was forming a base triple and that kind of positioned that two prime hydroxyl out towards the five prime splice site for catalysis. So that was so they even though it wasn't pre-catalytic, they hypothesized that maybe that's the configuration of the adenosine for the first step of splicing. But then there was another paper from Yi Gong Shi, and they had um, this was done uh, they, they said it was done before the branching reaction, so it was pre-catalytic, but the adenosine in their um, structure was pairing with U2 which is the second residue of the intron um, through Watson-Crick pairing. So, there's, it, so it's basically, there's two competing models and we were wondering, you know, which one is correct? Um, not, so the, the first one, it was not pre-catalytic. The second one is pre-catalytic from Yigang Chi's lab, but it's different from the adenosine position found in Kaoshin and Guy's lab. 
Um, and so we wanted to capture uh, the, the, the adenosine in the active site. And so what we found was that in, and so this is also work done by Daniel Hack and Boris Rudolph, um, a grad student in the lab. And what they found was that anytime we try to capture the adenosine in the active site, it got, it was adenosine always, would always be popped out. Like it would be always away in the active site. The majority of the particles that we would collect when we were attempting to do this, were always in this other state where the branch side helix was vertical, held in position by this pi and eta tetra loop receptor interactions. That's because these tandem tetra loop receptor interactions are quite the combination of the two. The binding strength is quite high. Um, looking at these tecto RNAs that Luke Jager from UC Santa Barbara developed, the KD is approximately eight nanomolar. And so it's pretty, it's a pretty strong interaction. And so we wanted to be in the horizontal position. So we wanted to disrupt these tetra loop receptor interactions. So uh, what we did is we mutated these J GNRA tetra loops to UUCG tetra loops, which do, do not interact to form this receptor interaction. And then looked at the effect on, on catalysis. So basically this is again, a forward splicing um, uh, assay. So, so here you have the wild type fully spliced intron. And when you mutate these in this mutant uh, at low magnesium, you're getting a higher molecular weight lariat band. And what this represents is the first step of splicing has happened, but the second step has not happened. So it's kind of stuck. It does the first step, it can't do the second step. And so it's a higher molecular, so it consists of lariat with a three prime exon attached. So it's still functionally active. So it's it's not like these mutations have disrupted the catalysis. The catalysis is about equivalent. It just can't proceed on to the second step. And when you increase the magnesium concentration from 2.5 millimolar to 5, 5 millimolar, it then starts to overcome some of the some of those effect, mutational effects and then form full length variant. And the reason I show this is to show that this mutant, mutant is not disrupting the catalytic activity. It's still catalytically relevant. Sorry. Um, and so we collected CrowEM data and we were able to solve it at an overall resolution of 3.3 angstroms. And again, the core is higher um, resolution. And looking at the density, this is density for the helix in the horizontal position sticking straight out of the screen. So we were successful in capturing the horizontal position that we thought was needed for the adenosine residue to, to be an active site. Because if it was in the horizontal position, but, but by, by default, that means the adenosine has already been pulled out. And so looking at the core of this structure, we can see that the adenosine residue is pointing inward towards the inside of the branch site helix. And this two prime, two prime hydroxyl is pointing directly towards the cis phosphate of the five prime splice site. So this, the cis phosphate means the, that's the phosphate that's cleaved or broken in this reaction. So this is the first nucleotide of the intron. And that's, that's leading into the five prime exon. And so looking at the density, um, this, this shows that this, five prime splice site is intact. So it hasn't yet been cleaved. So there's continuous density for the five prime splice site. And there's also density for this conserved adenosine residue with that two prime hydroxyl right there. And looking at it in, in the context of the catalytic metals. So you can see that this is the, the bulge adenosine, two prime hydroxyl nucleophile. That's a cis phosphate of the five prime splice site. And then we see these two catalytic metals. And typically when it's re when it's uh, reactive, these the distance between the metals is usually four, approximately four angstroms. Here it's slightly larger, it's 6.4. And that explains how we were able to capture it and it didn't get cleaved because it hadn't compacted down yet totally to cause uh, catalysis. And we could see density for these catalytic metals in the core as well. 
And so looking at it up close, you can see that um, this adenosine residue actually forms this unusual strained base triple. So it basically, it, 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 instead of everything being planar, so you have the, the planar Watson-Crick um, base pairs within the helix. And this, this uh, adenosine residue actually points at an angle to these two um, bases up there to form this what to form this base triple, and this this uh, base triple it's a cis Watson Crick pair here, and this adenosine residue forms a sugar edge base pair with this um, cytosine over here, and so this base triple is how this adenosine residue is positioned for catalysis in in the group two intro. And so if you just uh, look at sub, just artificially substituting in other residues at that position, they would not be compatible with that base triple arrangement. If you put a guanosine, a cytosine, or, or, or a uridine there, either it will cause a steric clash or it will not be able to properly form the hydrogen bonds needed for that, that base triple. So this, this, this base triple is highly evolved to select for an adenosine uh, residue. Um, and then uh, we also wanted to see what happens if you make mutations in this base triple. So this is the wild type here. So you have this GC pair, the A pairs with that GC pair there. And then we, we made different mutations here. Um, and majority of them disrupted the spicing reaction. But there is one, so that's the wild type. Then there's one where we converted that GC pair into an AU pair. And that had the exact same activity as the wild type. And then we, we thought this was unusual, but what's also interesting is this, this AU pair um, found in this mutant is the typical sequence that you get in the, in the branch site helix of the spicosome. So it's, it's unusual that the only mutation that worked is the one that's typically found in the, in the spicosome as well. So in the group two intron, you have a conserved sequence surrounding the branch site adenosine in the branch site helix. So it's it's forming a base, this adenosine forms a base triple with this RY pair here. In this, you know, the human spicosome, this adenosine forms this, a base triple with this AU pair. So that's the mutation that we made the prior one. So this is emulating what we see in the spliceosome and it has full activity. So, so that indicates that, you know, there is an evolutionary connection again between the two in terms of architecture in an active site. Um, and so then looking at our structure compared with those two spliceosome structures that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, our structure and the density in the modeling is compatible with what's seen in the work from Kaoshi and Guy's lab, that this, this type of base triple is also found in the splice. So this was post-branching without the five intact five prime splice site. The ours is pre-branching with the in intact five prime splice site. But in both cases, you get this two prime hydroxyl extruded out from the helix, pointing into solution to attack the splice site. And actually this configuration of the adenosine was not to my knowledge, it was not predicted before, because uh, when I was in grad school, even I guess there's a there's a bias towards thinking, oh, because it's a bulge at the secondary structure level, so the adenosine residue is going to be like pointing out, but it's not. So it's actually, actually pointing inward, and that makes makes chemical sense because that's the only way the two prime hydroxyl could be accessible to you know to attack the five prime splice site. Yeah, so this arrangement is seems to be conserved all the way from the group two intron to the spliceosome. And so initially when I saw this modeling, I'm like, that's kind of weird. You know, you have these two Watson Crick pairs and you have this adenosine residue coming in at a weird angle. Uh, is that very common? Like I, I, I wasn't aware of, you know, that happening too often. Um, and so we did a search of various RNA structures, including crystal structures. So there is a crystal structure of this viral RNA. Um, it's at two point zero angstrom, so it's very high resolution. And it's very clear you have, in that in that one, you have a 
you know, one, uh, two ba uh, base pair here, and then you have this base triple coming in at an angle. So this does, and it it does happen in the literature. Um, and also, the, if you uh, people that have genetic diseases with mutations in this base triple have very severe human disease. So there's there's multiple mutations you can have around the brain site. Um, but the ones that are most severe leading to the worst diseases are ones that are disrupting that base triple ensemble. So that's also consistent with the importance of this uh, of this um, of this interaction. And so now I just want to get back to the evolution again. And so there, there is a, a protein. So I, I talked about that there's an RNA connection with between the spisosome and the group two intron. There's also a protein connection. So the, the spisosome has this protein known as PRP8. And this PRP8 protein has domain as a domain structure, which is similar to the matrace protein in group two intron. So in both cases, you see there's an RT domain here. Uh, and then there's a the DNA endonuclease domain. But in the in the spliceosome, the RT and endonuclease domains are not functional, but they exist. And so it's it's odd that at, and the PRP8 is a very highly conserved core protein in the spliceosome. So when you look at the RNA protein cores of both systems, there's a lot of similarity. So this is a diagram showing the catalytic domain five in the U6 in the spliceosome. Uh, looking down the, uh, uh, the the axis, the long axis of the helix. And then you have the branch site in both cases held in position by this a portion of the matrix and a portion of PRP8. So it looks, and the, these both of these structures are very homologous to each other. So at its core, it looks like um, the spliceosome is still a group to intron, but it's accumulated, you know, 100 other proteins to have it do more complicated things like regulation of alternative splicing and so on. But the RNA protein core is highly conserved between the two systems. And another point of similarity between the two systems is the conformational dynamics of the branch site helix containing the adenosine. So when you look at the exact same analogous stages of splicing in both systems, the, the branch site helix exists in the same configuration, both the group two intron and the spliceosome. So if you overlay the two structures for both, you can see that the, the group two intron and the spliceosome, they both have this 90 degree swinging action between the two stages of catalysis. So not only is the RNA active site conserved between the two systems, you have a protein connection, but you also, also the conformational dynamics of the two systems are also conserved. So this is further evidence for um, the, the, the evolutionary connection between the group two introns and the spliceosome. And also the fact that the group two intron is a retro element, it inserts into, into DNA. That means the spliceosome actually originated from a retro element. And so this has implications for the splicing of eukaryotes in general. And so this is um, an evolutionary hypothesis that was first proposed by Eugene Koonin from the NIH. And so what he proposed was that, so we know that group two introns started off in bacteria first billions of years ago. Um, and they during the endosymbiotic event where you had you bacteria invading an archaeal host to form organelles, these group two introns were carried into this primitive eukaryote and you can see the, the group two introns are shown in red in this diagram here. So these chloroplasts and mitochondria had these group two introns. Then these group two introns started to invade, invade the host archaeal genome. When they did that, uh, they invaded not only non-coding sequences, but coding sequences. So you can imagine if you have introns going into a coding sequence and you're having translation happening in the same compartment, what could theoretically happen is you could have the ribosome trying to translate a gene before all the introns are spliced out, which would be detrimental because then the ribosome will be making a garbage protein, just translating non-coding sequence. 
So Eugene, Eugene Kunin proposed that once this happened, the cell evolved a nuclear membrane around the genome, and that spatially separated splicing into the nucleus from translation in the cytoplasm. So it's very possible that these introns invading our genomes and spreading likely, in my my, my view, I, I think it's a logical hypothesis that it's, it's that it could have led to the evolution of eukaryotes and internal membranes like the nuclear membrane. Um, and so one last thing I want to end off with is that doing CrowEM on protein-free RNA is quite difficult. Um, so, and that's, that's shown by the fact that there's literally like thousands of high resolution protein structures solved by CrowEM. By high resolution, I mean, you know, three angstroms or better approximately. However, the number of protein-free RNA structures, the three angstroms or better, is literally, you can literally count it on one hand of, of, of unique protein-free RNA structures. Um, and so we've, we've personally found that protein-free RNAs, they tend to aggregate, misfold, and denature in the thin vitrified ice. Um, and, and so we've, we've been working on trying to figure out how to get this to, how to get protein-free RNAs to work with CryoEM. And recently we were able to make um, progress. So this is work done by Daniel Hack and Boris Rudolph in the lab. And so just recently, we were able to get the structure of a, of a nanonucleotide RNA to 2.5 angstroms. So it's a relatively small RNA, which is difficult for, makes it even more difficult for cryogram. And the core of this is about 2.5 angstroms. Um, and, so, uh, and so, and so Dan, Daniel Hack, the postdoc, he is in the process of, of heading a company to provide this as a service to the biotech industry to solve RNA structures. Because we've been, we've been approached by multiple companies that, um, where they wanted to get high resolution structures of RNAs that are typically between 100 to 150 nucleotides in size. And at the time we didn't, we didn't know how to do it. But now that we've made this, this first progress, we um, like to, and so Dan wants to offer this as a, as a service to biotech companies. And so I can't talk, uh, uh, so we're in the process of filing a provisional patent on, on the technique, so I, I can't talk about it right now, but we're, we're, we're preparing a manuscript on this, on this work. And hopefully it will be useful for the CAS project because be, it'll be a lot easier to get structures of protein-free RNAs. Um, um, so I wanted to thank all the people in the lab. So Dan, who did all the, the uh, CryoEM work, Boris, who did a lot of the computational um, data processing, um, and then everyone else in the lab who's worked on all the projects. It, none of that would have been possible without them. Um, and also want to thank NIH for funding as well. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. And uh, yes. Magda Konarska is also clapping. I don't know if you Tor, can see other people. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, so I can start. So I don't know how much you can talk about the, the last slide. And I don't know if you mentioned. So can you at least briefly explain what was the trick to get this? Um, RNA uh, of of that good resolution is it some kind of caging when you have something else and you and you try to force this RNA to be there or can you just mention a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I wanted to, but I, I we talked to the tech transfer office at UCSD and they said until they filed the provisional patent, I can't mention it. But once it's filed, it should be soon. Um, I, I can I can talk about it, but they said I'm not allowed to. <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. Right. That's... But I just want to let you know, like we've made, we're gonna, we're writing up the manuscript right now, so we are, we are publishing it, so we're not keeping it secret, but, but just until the patents filed, I can't no, say. That's 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 good. Uh, so then I have another one, and we can wait for other questions. So, because this is what I try to do with with Magda, I try to invest, like investigate, like what residues will make a good triple. 
That's and great. then I talked also with Eric Veskov about it. And I think that our conclusion is that it's so difficult to predict what will make a good triple, because as you said, I mean, just the angle of this third residue that was roughly like 45th degree, that would be in, in like in my calculations, that would be something that I wouldn't use as a as a triple. Yeah. Uh, so like and it's it's a weird base triple too, because it's like it's base basically skips a base pair, then there's another base pair, and, and this are this it's going going inside itself to make a base triple, which is quite unusual, I thought. It's in this all in the same helix. So it's not like a base triple, but between different regions of the RNA. It's between one helix. Interesting. And you could see only one this kind of triple, as you mentioned, in this one of this viral RNA or no, there's no. multiple. There was multiple, but the the one that had the high, highest resolution was two point zero okay, X rays. No, I can send yeah. you. I, I I don't have the slide on me. I can I can find it and send it to you. But it's it's quite clear from that two point zero density. You know that that's how how it is. Right. That's that's yeah. That's very interesting because that was also a comment of Eric Vesco that RNA is to some extent so capable of doing if like weird things sometimes that it will like if you mutate the, some of the residues there are many ways to, uh, for rna to accommodate different orientation and and just just it will still in some cases it will still you know make some kind of interactions or will use water or will change an edge or this kind of stuff that it was that it's so difficult to to make a clear definition because this is also what what I'm working on with another group of people, and maybe they are even here. So we kind of go, we we go back or we went back just to understand like base pairs and what are the limit of just regular base pairs, because you can see also like all range of interactions. And if you want to annotate the whole PDB, it's a little bit difficult to, I mean, it's easy when you when everything is so clear and, and you have pl uh, plane, but if it gets a little bit off, like in this case, probably most of the tools, they will not even pick this as a as a proper hydrogen bonding and proper yeah, plane to make triples. So, And it also makes me wonder, because um, when we model, we have a bias to making things planar. And we've seen some cases where like, why is it, you know, you, you want to just make it planar. In, in some cases, maybe that's, it. we're not seeing that in the data because there's a bias toward against that. Yeah. No, no, so that would be another problem because as you showed the the density maps, I mean, resolution is high, but still I th it seems that there is so much space to to move things uh, a little bit around. So maybe then, yeah, there is a, this is what we expect. The base pair should be planar. So this is what we, all these refinement tools, they they push the, the base pairs to, 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 our plan, to be planar. And then this is also then very difficult to, to make these definitions because there is a kind of like of cycles that the, some kind of definitions were used before. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess a computational thing would be to look at the density, you know, again, from a lot of different structures and see how often this happens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 but it's good. We'll, we'll have a lot of things to do uh, as a community. Very interesting. It looks like uh, Magna has a question. I think you're trying to raise your hand. Yeah. Go ahead, Magda. Yeah, I. Oh, hey, Magda. So, hello, hello. I am puzzled by by this difference that you're seeing between uh, cryo EM and crystallography, uh, and 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 the impact of proteins in the two. Because so, then what is your current understanding or, or interpretation of the fact that you can get different structures? Slight, there are slight differences, or how would you comment on that? You know, between cryo EM and and crystallography, in the context of plus minus proteins, that is, to what what are these proteins then altering? You know, because it may actually, in in terms of the interpretation, this may have a major impact, right? Yes, uh, no, I totally agree with you. So, like, there's a one the biggest difference between crystallography and cryo EM is in crystallography you have the crystal lattice, and the crystal lattice can create um, it could favor certain states by just compacting everything down. And it doesn't let you see all the conformational dynamics. So this, these conformational dynamics that I showed in domain six, we tried capturing that with crystallography. We, we were able to see just a tiny bit of it. Like we see the, what, that branch side helix would kind of lose density, like it was dynamic. But we never saw it swing out and down, like in and up and down like that. 
And that's because in the context of the crystal lattice, there's no space for it to do that. So that's the advantage of CrowEM versus crystallography for that is that we can actually capture conformational dynamics that are not possible within the confines of a crystal lattice. But is that then, you know, because you're talking about, you know, relatively speaking, a major difference, right? I mean, this, this, yeah. this dynamics is, is quite, quite significant. But then is it then going in the opposite direction when it comes to micro changes? Because I'm, I'm still going back to the those those triples that you've seen uh, through crystallography, which you are not seeing through through uh, cryoEM. I'm just interested in in you know because it it really may be that we are seeing different worlds through using different techniques. So, are you talking about the base triples in the active site? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, do, we do see them in CrowEM as well, those base triples. We do. Yeah. But like uh, in crystallography, you, you may be aware of this, but we saw different configurations of the of the, of the Yeah, yeah that's what I'm talking about. The difference yeah. is in the, right. So we, we do see slight differences. I, I personally, I think the base triples are, are dynamic. And I think you do as well from your work mm -hmm. um, in the spliceosome. And so we're capturing just different states of the of the base triples. And, and personally, I think... The base triples, um, they are having an effect on catalysis, but in terms of like, I guess the quantum mechanics of how the position of the base triple is affecting, like there's probably quantum effects I'm guessing in the active site that we, I have no idea like how to auto interpret stuff, something like that. Yeah, no, so, so I, I fully agree there. I, I'm, I'm just really puzzled by the, you know, because because maybe we are really missing some range of, of those micro, let's call it micro dynamic changes that may be very significant. Yes. But by using one or the other of the two uh, structural techniques, we just. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And also another thing is there's probably micro changes that are so transient. Yeah. Um, that we don't see them like you know, probably one is favored but but it, during catalysis it does move between the two but one is highly favored and so we hardly ever see that in structural biology yeah okay okay that's where like that's i guess computational stuff would probably you know help in that regard maybe yeah no that's a great question mm -hmm. okay thank you interesting i have um, and one question from conan do you see any uh, biotech or biomedical applications for using group two introns mechanism in your minds? Gene editing. Someone so there is to... a there is a, that's a great question. So there is um, something called a prime editor from David Liuzab, and it it kind of uses principles of of a group two intron. It's not a group two intron, but they they took a Cas nine and they put on um, put on a reverse transcriptase, and they also have added group two intron reverse transcriptase in their latest iterations. And they've kind of used that as a, as a pretty pretty good base editor. Uh, but, but I guess they mean, and this person means uh, in terms of genome editing with the group two intron, we are we, we are planning on, we, well, we, we are looking at that possibility. Uh, but the one of the major problems with using the group two intron as a, as a base editor is that it has a two, it has a two prime, five prime phosphodiesterol linkage. Um, and there's something in the nucleus of, of human cells called the debranching enzyme. So the debranching enzyme actually cuts that lariate bond. And that kind of makes it more difficult to use for genome editing compared to other complexes. So there is a, a certain disadvantage to using it. Okay, we have one more for Shrikan. I hope I am pronounced it correctly. Uh, do you know if this uh, adenosine nucleobase uh, facing inwards is a common uh, in RNA structures? Is it bit, is it do the interactions between DNA or RNA RNA interactions? Is it specific for DNA or RNA protein interactions? Well, the, this is uh, specifically um, it, it's 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 just an RNA RNA interaction. But I don't. I'm, I'm trying to find. Let me just find that. Um figure that I have showing that uh, showing in different structures that same um, base triple. Right. 
second. Here it is. I share the screen. So here's an example of, here's some other examples. So this is uh, in the flavivirus RNA. You can see that this is a 2.0 angstroms. It's a very similar looking, a very similar angle to what we see here. And we also see it in the ribosome. This is like lower resolution, of course. It's not as sharp as the one on the right here. Um, and we see it in, so basically there's four examples. One in the group two intron, one in the spliceosome, one in this virus, and one in the ribosome. So it's not, I guess it's not that common, but it, but it's found. Yeah, it's just, and there is only one, always one residue in between, or it's not always. Yes, yeah, there's one base pair in between that it skips over. Yeah. Yeah, especially this one on the right, that 2.0 angstroms, that convinced me even more. Because yeah. it was such a, when um like when Dan, the postdoc, he first modeled this, I'm like that has to be wrong. It should be planar. But yeah, but the fact that the spliceosome uh, Kaushina guys lab also modeled it that way as well that give us more confidence. That two different labs interpreted the same way. Interesting, but but you 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 imagine that also base pairs could also base pair, like two residues they can also base pair and and you will be fine with this that much the. Uh, I don't know how to call it, being off out of plane, that we we should to some extent like rethink how we think about bases. Yeah, I, I guess when you see non-canonical, like when you when you have a, a helix that's like you know Watson Crick, and then you have a bunch of non-canonicals in a row, you do you do get crazy um, base pair planes in those regions quite often. So it it does happen, but this is just a yeah, it it, it does happen in that in that regard. Interesting. Uh, one more question from Eugene. How, how uh, the searches for these motifs were performed? Uh, I forgot. It, uh, Dan used a certain program. I, I'd have to ask him. I don't remember. Sorry. <laughs> it's a, it, the paper is published, so you can you can check okay. it. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we don't see, I don't see any other questions, so maybe there is more from the audience. I got Wait. one question in a DM instead of on the, the group, so I can read it out. Um, uh, I was wondering if you have a sense for the diversity of RTs, um, having a hard time reconciling their close interactions with D6 during reverse splicing, along with the finding that RTs can function in trance. Um, what do you, uh, I guess I don't understand. What do you mean by in trans? Because it, it, you mean with other group two introns or? Mm -hmm. Rihanna, if you're, if you're there and willing to undo your mic, maybe you can clarify the question. Right, so there was uh, there was one manuscript that showed that a intron without an RT can use a RT from a different intron and still function. So I think that's what they mean. Yeah, no, that that does happen. So you can have a single RT function, a, a single RT function in assisting multiple group two introns in a cell. That does happen. Uh, but usually those group two introns are you um similar in sequence. So there, there'll be some variation, but they'll be quite similar in in, in sequence. So the uh, work that I did in my my PhD, the bioinformatics, I, I showed that the RT sequence and the RNA structure they co-evolve with each other, and so I could classify the phylogenetic tree of the RT matches the phylogenetic tree of the RNA structure, and so usually you don't have one RT assist a group two intron sequence that's very different. So usually the, the it's related. Those introns are related when they act in trans like that. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, I think that's all for questions for now. And we perfectly at nine o'clock, uh, my time zone at least. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. I think uh, really enjoyed yeah. the talk and certainly yeah, an great. interesting okay. system. Hey, thanks for inviting me. This is great. Combining experiments with uh, bioinformatics. So uh, yeah, very interesting at the journey. So yeah. Thank you, everyone, and see you in two weeks. Have a good two week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>